My colleagues may not like a lady doctor, but the patients don't seem to mind one little bit. A town's newest doctor is put to the test. She's nothing to look at, but I'll give it a go. I can't leave him to die. Both on the professional and personal fronts. So a patient of mine sleeping under this roof is your mistress. Do you drink a lot of alcohol? I'd bath in the stuff if I could. Bramwell, Monday at 9. Now on Granada, it's time for our very own Granada Tonight, presented for you by Bob Greaves and Lucy Meacock. Tonight we pay tribute to Harold Wilson, the adopted Liverpudlian who went on to become the most successful Labour leader of all time. We have reaction from Westminster to today's sad news and a fascinating insight into the life of Lord Wilson of Rebo. That's Granada Tonight. He was the most successful Labour leader in history. This morning he died peacefully in his sleep at the age of 79. Harold Wilson, who dominated political life for more than a decade and spent eight years as Prime Minister, died this morning at a London hospital. He had been ill for some time. During his career, he represented the constituencies of Ormskirk in West Lancashire and Highton on Merseyside. As a mark of respect, the House of Commons adjourned early today. After tour correspondent Alison Tarpey was there. Tributes have been pouring in today at Westminster for the man who led Labour to four general election victories. MPs have spent the afternoon in the House of Commons paying tribute to Harold Wilson, a man who was clearly thought highly of by all sides. People always remember the politician and the statesman, but I remember him, of course, as someone who cared desperately about ordinary people. Um, little things, if you were at an official reception and you said to him, Prime Minister, I'd like to introduce you to the people who did the work. He would stop and spend just enough time to go and talk to people, genuinely talk to people. He believed in having women in his cabinet and women in his government long before it was, in quotes, fashionable. I don't think they make them like Harold anymore, but having said that, each era throws up the person that it needs. And we needed a Harold Wilson, the country needed a Harold Wilson. And when he became Prime Minister in 64 and in the run-up to that election after 13 miserable years, he was like a breath of fresh air. He was talking about technology, about a new era. Um, he was young and um, people responded to that. It was the tradition uh, in those days for the leader of the Labour Party to wind up their national election campaign at the gates of what was Metropolitan Vicars, GCAI, in Trafford Park, uh, which was then, all of it was then in my constituency. And so we had some very lively meetings there, um, but always very friendly. And uh, it is always, it will always be his friendship and his courtesy that I will always remember. And now we can look back at the momentous life and times of Harold Wilson with Angela Pears. Harold Wilson was born near Huddersfield in 1916 into a middle-class family. At the age of six on a trip to London, he prophetically posed in front of number 10 Downing Street. Harold Wilson had one elder sister. The family moved to the Wirral when he was 16. He went to the Wirral Grammar School and then to Oxford University, where he became the youngest ever Don and worked with the Liberal Four social three. reformer Sir William Beveridge on employment July, research. During the war, he became a civil servant, but his decision to stand as a Labour MP surprised others who'd studied with him. Harold took almost no interest in politics, whatever, at Oxford. Uh, I think he joined the Liberal Club, but he wasn't active in it. In fact, those who knew him at Oxford was staggered that uh, after the war he suddenly took a great interest in politics. As the member for Ormskirk and later Highton, Harold Wilson served in the Attlee government and his first encounter with the cameras came when he announced reductions in rationing. I have just come straight here from the House of Commons where I've been announcing some further changes in the clothing rationing scheme. While I've not been able to announce uh, any increase in the number of coupons, we have been able to reduce the points on a number of items and to take some off the ration altogether. 
He supported the left-winger Nai Bevan and wasn't the obvious choice to lead the party in 1963 when the right-winger Hugh Gateskill died. From then on, Harold Wilson tried to please both left and right wings to keep a balance in the party. He did work with left and right, united the party, very important, and he had great imagination. Uh, his uh, New Britain speeches in 1964 inspired people. Uh, he uh, came out with this argument about the white heat of the technological revolution, which was not what people thought, that he would put on a white coat and go around the economy with a blow lamp and modernizing. What he said was this. He said, technical change is coming in a pace, and if you don't uh, uh, have a planned transformation of the economy, people will be burned up in the white heat of the technological revolution, i.e. they'll become redundant and unemployed. Absolutely right. Harold Wilson also believed in education as the means to improve both the fortunes of individuals and of the country, and he wanted full employment. As leader of the opposition, he made education, employment and scientific development his central campaigning themes. We believe there are such reserves of skill, of ingenuity, of resource, of craftsmanship, of scientific ability in this country, that if these were mobilized for the sake of the nation, Britain could become once again, no, not the workshop of the world, that phrase carries with it too much of a taint of exploitation, but at any rate, the pilot plant of the world and the tool room of the world. And that is our future. Labour won the 1964 election, but couldn't put all ideas into action because of pressure on the pound. And despite the pressure of government, Wilson continued to represent the northwest constituency of Highton, ensuring that money was invested in the region. Because of his position as a Liverpool MP, he did remember the plight of Liverpool, and I think he did try to bring employment to the North West. Of course, that was coupled with his national policies and his belief in the, uh, that full employment should be preserved because, of course, of his associations with beverage during the war years. He liked to portray the image of man of the people, smoking a pipe and wearing the familiar raincoat. He was always at home with his constituents. He liked football and show business and entertained the cast of Coronation Street at number 10, as well as awarding the MBE to the Beatles. People used to ask him, do you support Everton or Liverpool? And he used to produce this photograph of Huddersfield Town, cup winning team for the 20s, I think, from his pocket. So he managed to evade that without offending anyone, so, which is quite a feat in Liverpool. It always amused me that he was so <laughs> taken by people in show business that he, he'd speak, I was with Ken Dodd last night, and we'd say yes. <laughs> but he really thought it was quite something to be on speaking to him with the Beatles and Ken Dodd and so on. Sorry about that, Harold. Harold Wilson created the Open University and set up new skills centres in the country. He established the beer and sandwiches regime at number 10, but also upset the unions with the white paper in place of strife. <laughs> These restrictive proposals were dropped eventually, but relations had been damaged. Abroad, he refused to send troops to Vietnam and laid the groundwork for Britain to enter Europe. He was also dogged by controversy with his intense style of government, the informal debating of the kitchen cabinet, the closeness to his secretary, Marcia Williams, questions about his fascination with the Soviet Union, and rumors which were later confirmed in the book Spy Catcher by Peter Wright about his being monitored by MI5. Though the Conservatives won the 1970 election, Harold Wilson took Labour to victory again in 1974 with a slim majority. Much to everybody's surprise, uh, Labour won with Wilson as leader with a small majority and then he showed real courage. Most of his immediate advisers were saying, look Harold, you can continue like this for another two or three years, don't worry about another election, but he knew better and he knew that he could go and win. So we fought the second election in 74, and again, much to everybody's surprise, but not mine, and certainly not his, he got a substantial majority, which enabled him to uh, sort of carry on, and then eventually hand over the leadership of the party. And just before that second election in 74, Harold Wilson defended recent economic measures in an interview with World in Action. I know people don't like paying a bit more for the whiskey or even the beer. I'm sorry about the beer, myself, speaking myself as one who likes beer in my clubs in Lancashire, but and and, and, in, and I've got it in Downing Street too. 
Uh, I'm sorry about that. I'll pay more for French wine or any other kind of wine. But I'd rather do that and reduce milk prices for the average family. One of the central things about Harold Wilson is he, he was the first television prime minister. By that I mean he was the first prime minister to reach number 10 Downing Street, equipped with the professional experience and mastery of television techniques. And uh, this gives them a place in broadcasting history. Harold Wilson gained a further place in political history when he resigned in 1976 and was succeeded by Jim Callaghan. It was an action which surprised some, but not his close friend and fellow Northwest MP and cabinet colleague, Barbara Castle. He told me beforehand that uh, he'd told, given the Queen the exact date when I tried to get the exact date out, and he wouldn't give it me. Uh, and, you know, one wondered whether he really meant it, but he did. And he, he said to me, uh, it's been, I've had eight years of hell leading the party through its t period of turmoil and division and splits and rows and so on. And tacked as he was, vilified by the press, he said, I've had enough. Even after his resignation, criticism and controversy continued to surround Harold Wilson about his choice for his final honours list. He remained as MP for Highton until 1983, when he became Lord Wilson of Riveau. But his health deteriorated, and Harold Wilson and his wife Mary spent their time quietly at their homes on the Isles of Scilly and in London. His latter years a complete contrast to the heady days of ambition and government. Harold Wilson, who died today.